Do you want to know why people buy the deepest and darkest secret emotions? Well, this episode is for you. Hello, Sales Nation, and welcome to today's episode of the Sales Man Podcast. On today's show, we have David Craig White. Find out more about him over at davidcraigwhite.com. He's a sales and leadership coach. On today's show, we're diving into the psychology of why people buy, how we can ask questions that pulls on the psychology, that pulls on their emotions so that they drive urgency within themselves to close a deal, and a whole lot more. So with all that said, let's jump in to today's episode. David, welcome to the Sales Man Podcast. Thanks, Will. Thanks for having me. You're more than welcome, sir. I'm glad to have you on. I'm going to dive into a a huge topic today, and then we'll narrow it down and niche it down over the course of the next 35, 40 minutes or so, and we'll get some real practical um, tips, tricks, not not tricks, that's the wrong word, T- tips, psychology, and tactics, I guess, out of the other end of this. But I'm going to lead this with a purposefully open-ended question. I always say this so that the audience and you don't think I'm super lazy and just asking something so broad and open. Uh, but I clearly, I don't want to color or, or point, push you in a direction with this. So, David, probably the most open-ended question I've asked in the past six months on the show. Why do people buy? Why do people buy? Very good question, Will. Very good question. Um, they buy for a enormous, huge amount of reasons. <laughs> um, of course, I think the when you look at the people like uh, Tony Robbins, you look at um, people... Like, God, I'm going to forget his name now. Terrible with his name. So the book, he's always talking about the why instead of the what. Come on, give me his name. Uh, Simon Sinek. Yes, yes. God damn it. How could I forget his name? You know, that, those kind of guys are perfectly down the right path. Um, they're, of course, very. They're thinking very much on a psychological level and on an individual level um, and getting to sort of the why behind the why. Um, and, and we don't take that into sales enough. Um, so why do people buy? I believe people buy very, we're all very selfish. And I don't say that in a bad way. I don't mean that we're horrible, selfish people, but I I literally mean that everything we do is for a particular sort of self purpose in a way. Everybody's a specific profile type. If you do sort of, you know, everybody's done a profile personality type of uh, test and things like that. So they can see what type of people are who's more for the team, who's more selfish, all that kind of stuff. Um, but we don't tap into that when we uh, when we sell to people. Uh, we very much deal with what I like to call sort of uh, smokescreen reasons, which is the sort of higher level reasons uh, about why people buy, which is very much either feature benefit orientated or it's um, company level or website level orientated. Um, so I'll give you an example to make it a bit more tangible with that. If I work with a lot of sort of tech startups, so they're, they're companies selling sort of SaaS based solutions. It's, of course, a huge market now. Um, so typically a lot of them are selling some form of website software, which usually related to marketing, usually related to the website. So the, the typical thing what you get all the time is, of course, the training will happen in the company. The product training typically always comes first. You know, ram the product down the throat and then wonder why the salesperson spits product out for the next six months. Um, but then when the, when you go into a conversation, then you start asking questions, which are sort of leading questions, which are sort of relating to your product. Um, but then when you start asking questions in regards to uh, the website and general problems, then many salespeople typically look for some form of connection of, oh, yeah, I'm spending a lot of time on this here. Um, you know, spending a lot of time uh, editing posts on my website or fixing mistakes or um, I'm driving traffic to my website. I don't know what's going on when people get there. And then salespeople tend to sort of focus on that piece there and see that as the pain. You know, everybody always talks about pain. Uh, when, when we talk about sales, uh, what's your main challenges, what's your pains? And that, that's about as sort of deep as we go um, when we're having a conversation with people. And when it comes to sort of creating urgency, then I always say that everybody pretty much has a problem. You know, everybody on the website or in their job, they've all they've all got problems, all got things what could be better, could be nicer. Um, and the thing is, you're probably not the first person to call them and tell them this. Um, or even if you are, uh, I think the key mistake people make is, is the assumptions mistake is making the assumption that somebody gives a crap. Um, because most of the time they don't. 
or they don't see it as a big problem. So we've always got to tap into these sort of personal motives. And I, I, I sort of call them um, try and get down to the impact questions. You know, what's the impact of this? Um, and, and if you look at the typical questions you'll ask a salesperson, we, we always go through the typical discovery questions. You know, ask about their, their role, ask about the company, what do they do, what are your biggest challenges, questions such as uh, tool-related discovery, sort of what tool are you using for this or what solution are you using for that right now. Um, and most people will stop there, whereas underneath that is these sort of, I like to see, like sort of two levels of impact. Now, some sort of decent salespeople will go to that first level of impact, it's like, okay, so you don't have a solution for this right now, which means this is happening. I mean, well, what, what's, what's the sort of impact on your website because of that? Now, that's a really good question, and that will get you somewhere, and that will get you sort of deeper than, I don't know, 60%, 70% of other salespeople because they'll be floating up here on all, all the other <laughs> stuff. Um, and they dig into that. They find a little bit of information about that, that there, and they're like, okay, so you feel like you're, you're, you're losing out on sales because of this. Now, most people will see that sort of, you could say that's like benefit selling. So if somebody says, yes, I'm missing out on sales because I'm not optimizing my SEO or whatever it is, and then people see that as the pain. People think that is the motive for buying, um, but then they don't go any deeper than that, and then they wonder why there's no urgency from the buyer. Now, here's the thing is, if we take, let, let's take a real classic, typical example of an entrepreneur or a small company who has a website. Let's say they've got a web shop and they've set it up. They're self-made businessmen. They're selling products and they've done it for years and they're making some sales. They got some good revenue. That's probably about 60 percent of the business what could be optimized. But these guys are making money. They're happy. They're going home on time. And that's it. And maybe that's all they want from life. And yet they probably get pestered by salespeople calling them every week about optimizing all these other things. But here's the key thing is that there may be some pain there in regards to could, could I get more sales? Yeah. Or, or really, we're talking about pleasure there. Um, but, but the fact is, if there's no motive to fix that pain because life is, is, is good already, then, of course, you're just barking up the wrong tree. So I always talk to salespeople about getting that level below and then talking about stuff like, OK, so if, you know, let, let's say we're talking about that guy who can make more sales if he fixes his SEO or improves something on his website, installs your new software, then start asking him. It's like, OK, so you, you could talk, you, you talk about pain or pleasure, right? When we're talking about motives, there's pain, there's pleasure. Um, we're either working away from one towards another. So let's say we're talking about the we can we can angle it both ways. Right? You can talk about the pleasure of making more sales and then start to talk about what would happen as a result of that. But most people will focus on the pain. It's like, OK, so you're losing sales then. How many sales do you think you're losing right now? How many more do you think you could be making each day and how much is the revenue from those sales? Um, and then you can take them forward. I, I like to call it the time machine. Take them forward and say, OK, so if this is like happening in six months time, then what's the impact then on, on the business? And then you go that level deeper if you get a good question there. Yeah, so he, he maybe says, well, yeah, you know, we'll, we'll, we could be making more money, but we'll still be surviving uh, even if we do that. It's like, okay, but I mean, and then you go that level deeper and say, and what, what's the impact? What, what sort of impact does that have for you? And it's when you ask that, what impact does this have on you question, that then you get to the sort of personalized selling. Then you get to the real motive behind whether this person is a decision maker or not. You sort of get to the, the real reason uh, and the real motive, what's going to maybe drive this person to either buy it or sort of really go passionately to his boss with this idea to say, we need this. Because really deep down, they're thinking from a personal level, if we get this, my job's going to be so much easier. Is this the gap between when you have a conversation with someone and they jump on it and they're like, yes, this is exactly what I need because they've already had this conversation with themselves and then you've just cropped up at the right time versus when you speak to someone and you, you as a sales professional, you know it's the right solution for them, but they are then pondering and you've not really hit a nerve, you've not really hit on the emotion. Is that the gap between the two? I'm not going to say yes all of the time because most of the time it's due to poor qualification or uh, you said <laughs> barking up the wrong tree. Okay. Um, but I do believe it is the big gap. And I mean, I hear it all the time, right? How, how can I create urgency? 
Um, one of the reasons why urgency disappears is because salespeople don't follow up consistently. They don't end a call with concrete next steps, e.g., okay, so you're going to do this now, and then uh, I'm going to call you Tuesday after you've done that, and then we'll talk about next steps. Um, you know, they leave it too long. Therefore, they, the, the sort of buyer goes out of the buying zone, as I like to call it, which, which exists. Um, so, so, but, but I do think it is a very huge gap um, in the way people try and convince somebody to buy something. And I believe if there's no motive for something, then you're sort of, you're balancing a, a luck, really. It, it, I, am I getting this person in the right situation? Do they have enough money that maybe they can make a decision without worrying about it too much? Um, and of course, it also depends on what you're selling. So I, I want to, sorry, I'm jumping in here and I'm interrupting you, but it's because I want to, I don't want to gloss over something. So motive, you said something earlier on, which kind of like my face lit up as you said it. And this was that essentially people are selfish. And I think this is warrants diving into a little bit further. And I don't know whether there's how much research has been done on this. I don't know whether this is more people's opinions, but I tend to believe that almost every single thing that we do is because we're selfish and we're after something. So most people and not everyone, I guess, or, or no, maybe I'm going to say relatively strongly that 99% of people, when they give to charity, it's because they want the good feeling of giving to charity. They probably don't care all that much about the end result and they give them, and I'm talking about particularly the Western world, perhaps, you know, giving to homeless people, giving to, you know, charities in Africa, building schools, whatever it is in you know, places that are less well off typically than what, you know, England where I am kind of is. I will give, and I regularly can, and I keep it all private and I don't kind of publicize it, but I regularly give reasonable amounts of uh, cash to certain charities and I give it and then I feel great in the moment and then I don't really think it through. I don't really sit down and ponder, oh, this is really going to help um, this, you know, this young village with water, with whatever it is, a new school. Um, and I know damn well I'm doing it because it makes me feel good, not necessarily because it's helping anyone else out. And that's the classic example of giving to charity. Do you feel that when we are selling, we are being selfish in that even if we're trying to do the best for the customer, even if though we know paradoxically that giving them everything and helping them out, giving them loads of value, even if, even if you're not going to win the deal, wins more business than being selfish and manipulating, even if you understand that par paradox, do you still feel that sellers are being selfish in everything they do and then buyers are being selfish in everything they do because on a deeper level if we establish that or you know we establish that most of the time people have selfish motives we can build up on top of that right i mean we're talking here about tony robbins type of stuff right human needs everything you do every action you take is is to meet specific needs and those needs are for yourself now of course that doesn't mean that that, that makes you a, a horrible person uh you're satisfying some needs in a way, but, but you know, a big, a big need for a lot of people is, is they like to contribute, give, give, give money to charity. Um, but, but like you said, of course, that sometimes that's just for this short little small reason. Um, now, without delving sort of too deep into that, because we could talk hours about that kind of stuff. And just to go back to what you said, I, I don't believe that salespeople sort of go in selfishly. I'm not going to talk for all salespeople. Absolutely not. Um, some people do. But I, I like to think, and maybe this is just my positive thinking, uh, that, that I've seen a good shift in this. So when you work for a good company who invests in things like training and HR coaching, that they're also hiring the right kind of people. And when you give them the right training, then, then this is the kind of salesperson they're trying to be, right? The consultative type of salesperson who actually does want to help the customer fix a problem. But let me, let me ask you this, because this is going again that step deeper into the, the mindset of the sales professional. Are they wanting to solve the customer's problem because that leads to more commissions? And clearly it does because it's the right thing to do. Um, and clearly, morally, ethically, you don't walk home from the day in a, in a crazy sweat thinking how horrible you've been if you've done the right things throughout the day in you know, sales, business, life in general. But do you think if it, the tables were turned and perhaps 20, 30 years ago when you could get on the phone, use weird manipulation tactics, do you think if that was possible now, people would still do it because the underlying motive of everything is just to be selfish. People still can do it. They can. And there's, there's companies out there what still train and hire people and have them work like they did 30 years ago. That's, the, that's of course, the, 
the negative side of this profession is that people still believe and people can see. Of course, if you do something in that way, they still can make a profit out of it. They can get a, t a call center of 100 people, give them a script, get them to smash the phones and get the yellow pages type of calling out there. And, and you know, if they do it in a structured enough way and people make enough calls, they'll make some profit as a business. Those are the kind of companies, of course, who won't have trainers or coaches and stuff like that. They're more, you know, people churners. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so I've gone off topic now. Uh, <laughs> but it's just um, what I'm trying to get at is um, I, I'm not sure if it is binary, but I'm intrigued to get your thoughts of whether it is of whether everything we do when we go down and down and down and deeper of um, I want to sell this advertising space on the podcast um, because, you know, unselfishly, it funds the team of six of us now to put out great content for the audience. And essentially, we're using this corporate cash to <laughs> from the companies we work with. Essentially, it's nothing in the grand scheme of things for them. And we're giving to, you know, 500, 600,000 people or 1,000 downloads a month and, you know, hundreds of thousands of views on the blog and uh, 50, 60,000 views on YouTube, all this content we're giving to people and we're helping them improve their lives. But if I go one step deeper, if I wasn't making any money and this was a real struggle, I probably wouldn't be doing this, if that makes sense. So there's somewhat selfish there in that I'm not willing, I'm not willing to sit here and not get the flip side of being an entrepreneur of a sales professional of, of winning the business if it was totally horrible if it was horrendous i probably wouldn't and i'm being open and honest here with the audience but i probably wouldn't do that for the audience because i love them so much there has to be a selfish element to it that comes back to us and I'm, I'm i'm trying to focus on us and our brains so everyone's listening now can go either hey i i agree i am somewhat selfish or perhaps they've not looked deep enough into themselves to find the point that they do become selfish Everybody is in their in their own ways. So here's the thing: is I always talk about three things in the beginning. Uh, if I'm if I'm training from scratch, I always go through a few slides where I talk about if you want to work in sales, you have to believe in three things. Number one is yourself. Number two is the product and company, the product and solution, what you're selling. Number three is the company and what you work at. Yeah, so you've got to believe that 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 product and solution is is a good solution. It works. You're not ripping anybody off by trying to sell it. Um, and it actually offers value to someone, right? So, and, and that's the sort of, uh, that, that's the key thing there. Because if, if you're working, you've probably done it before, right? If, if you're working in a company where you what you're selling sort of, you know it doesn't work, you know it doesn't offer value, it's a hard slog. Um, you know, there's a lot of nice to have solutions out there. And when, you know, when, when we had the financial crisis in 2008, those nice to have solutions became extremely difficult to try and sell after that. Um, so, so I always like to say to people in the beginning, it's like you need to have these fundamental things in place. You have to also enjoy the company where you work, enjoy your colleagues, you know, like like the people who you work with. Um, otherwise, there's no point in getting up and going to work because um, it's, it's obviously not going to going to meet your needs. So, so there, there's a selfish element, but in that selfish element, of course, so long as the sort of your your core deeper meaning, like you do this show, if, if I gave you right now enough money to sort of pay your bills for the rest of your life and live a comfortable life, do you think you'd still carry on doing the show? So I've talked about this on the show in the past, and the answer is it, it, comfortable is obviously subjective. If it was a million quid a year, then no, I would not do the show anymore. If it was 20 grand a year, then of course I would. So I, I'm talking through the audience, and as I'm saving money, investing money, I kind of bring in as many people as I can through this journey. And a lot of people in the audience give me advice on this because they're a lot further beyond it than what I am. Um, but the the goal of the show for the audience is to help them thrive in sales and life. The goal of it for me is to help me become, as you described, financially independent, which is through owning some property, through owning um, certain kind of ways of going into the stock market, having cash reserves, things of that nature. So again, to be open and honest with you, it depends what you mean by comfortable. Now, if we reframe this as, would I retire and live on a beach for the rest of my life? Then no, because I know what exactly would happen. You'd give me a million quid a year, six months down the line, I'd be bored out of my mind. And I'd be thinking, well, how can I make that four million quid a year? I'm comfortable now, my needs are met. Um, but then I probably then I would probably jump back into the show and just go, I'd probably invest 600 grand a year into Facebook ads and explode it. So a kind of roundabout answer to your question of, uh, yes, yes, and no. Think, think about what you said there. Is like, I give you enough money so that your needs are met, 
but you'd probably end up coming back and doing the show anyway and investing some money in it. That tells me that your needs wouldn't be met. Mm, it would be, uh, yeah. So maybe maybe we need to do define here something, David. We need to define what are our needs. So one of them, are you know, rightly or kind of like in the structure or not in the structure, one of them in some way must be a selfish need of being happy, essentially. Um, but what what other needs are we talking about? Because that'll pre-frame the conversation when we project this onto the buyer in a second. Yeah, okay. So, I mean, uh, you could do, some people call them needs, some people call them values. I'll, I'll take the sort of what Tony Robbins calls the human needs, because there's only six of those. Whereas if you do NLP value stuff, we can be here for three hours with a list of 300. Um, so Tony Robbins will also talk about, he'll, he talks about certainty. You know, you want to feel certain and sure about things that they're going to happen at a certain time and you won't do it otherwise. If there's some uncertainty uh, about it, then you're always holding off. Then the second one is sort of the total opposite. Uncertainty, what he also calls variety. Now, that's a big one for some people. Some people like to go and uh, parachute off a plane and things like that to get that, that, that whereas some people meet that in another way. Um, and then we have uh, significance. You'll typically find your... Um, you know, a CEO or people like uh, Grant Cardone might be big on significance. Um, that, that's feeling important, feeling unique. Um, and then we have, so we've got certainty, we've got uncertainty, we've got, then we've got the cheesy one, right? Love and connection. Yeah, so that's, uh, that. You can, you can get that in different ways. Love and connection can be your family. Love and connection, you can also feel inside of a company if the culture's good enough, right? You get your friends there, you may even find a girlfriend or, or a boyfriend in, in your company. Um, and then the last two are the, are the sort of ones which which I think are the big ones. Growth. Yeah, so you need to be growing all the time, a little bit every day. Uh, I always say that. I'm always big on growing and learning. Um, or just feeling like developing is the word, right? You're feeling like you're developing yourself. And then sort of last but not least, then we've got the, the contribution piece, which is what we were talking about before. Um, you feel you've got to feel, and this is a big one. I, I think especially in sales as well with the right people who are sort of, at the right company, doing the right job for the right reasons and really enjoying it for that reason is if you're selling a solution, what is really giving value to somebody, then there's a big piece of contribution about that. So some people t take, take, if we take sort of, we've got new business hunters, but then look at account managers. They got to be big on contribution because they're all about sort of, you know, keeping a hold of the customer, making sure the, the, the customer's happy and stuff. And yes, of course, that's so they can reach their KPIs and things. But if they're really passionate about their job and they've been at that same company for so long, trust me, contribution's big on the list of things to do. So when you take somebody out of that, and let's say somebody did win the lorry, and then they go and, you know, sit on the beach, they're going to be missing some of these needs. Well, I'll give you me, which will explain my little analogy of what I would do if you did give me a million quid a year. And so if I put these in order, I have probably growth as number one, then variety, and then certainty, which is interesting to me of obviously variety and certainty collide somewhat, which is why, clearly I've pondered this before from Tony Robbins' work, but that's why I want to become financially independent, which will allow me to take then more risks with the capital that I'm willing to risk. But I'll know that there'll never be a baseline zero. There'll never be a point where I've got to move in back with my dad because everything's, well, it would be probably moving with uh, uh, my partner now. She just bought a new place, but it would be, you know, that that's the worst case. And clearly the worst case scenario for me is not a big deal. I've got no kids. I've got no mortgage. I've got no real responsibility. The business could be run from anywhere. So I'm, I, and I, but I've engineered that. I've, I've very, very purposely put that in place before I took the leap into running my own business. And I, in sales, I purposefully rented and didn't have a mortgage for those exact reasons. I could then have that variety, change jobs, change roles. I've lived all around the UK in different sales roles. But it's interesting to me of this colliding between the variety and certainty with growth being at the top, but I've got um, no, you know, obviously you want to feel loved and connected. That's really part of basic human need. I'm not that fussed on being a contributor. That sounds ridiculous considering how much we give to the sales industry and how, I bet the best way to describe it probably is that I'm not bothered about my voice as an influencer, as a thought leader or anything like that. All the content we put out when you'll, you'll see this when this show goes out and regular listeners and people who follow us on Instagram know there's never clips of me ranting on the content that we put out. It's always sound bites from the guests. Again, because I'm, 
not fussed about being, as you described, the essentially the Grant Cardone of the the master of the sales universe, which he's very focused on, and that obviously strokes his ego, and he gets um, pay, uh, pleasure from that. So it's interesting. No offense, Grant, you're a great businessman. Oh, he's a legend, but I, I don't <laughs> think he would take any um, offense from saying that he likes his face plastered on as much as stuff as possible. I'm sure if he could have his face on his plane, he would do, but there's probably rules against that. Um, he get boxed <laughs> into his box of haters. I'm yeah, well, no, we, we, me, me and him have gone back and forth on numerous kind of content that we've both put out. So the audience knows the, um, the both friction and he's been very supportive of what we're doing as well, kind of behind the scenes. Um, so there's no, there's kind of like no doubt in anyone's mind of we've got different opinions on things. But again, it's going to his needs. So to tie this back to the buyer, and so we can get super practical with this and the audience can go from listening to this episode and go into a sales meeting perhaps this afternoon if they listen to this this morning and they can use it. These six traits, is this what we should be going as deep down to with the customer to get that urgency that we need to close the deal? Should we be trying to suss out whether they need certainty and so we need to give them guarantees, we need to give them case studies on pre previous deals that we've done, we need to get them in kind of speaking to other VPs of marketing that they've you've closed business with and that they've had great success with, or if they want growth, we need to reframe the product and the service that it's going to allow them, especially if they're an entrepreneur or C-suite, it's going to allow them to expand the either profits as a business owner or perhaps shareholder value in a public company. Should we be focusing on these six things, these six targets, and that's the level that we need to go to with these conversations? No. <laughs> good man i love it uh it's too deep for, for a okay. sales conversation right uh, i always say the same thing it's like you know it can take 45 minutes to make a breakthrough sometimes in a coaching session and it would be great if you could do that in a sales conversation with a prospect however it can also take six hours to make a breakthrough with a with a coach with a coachee as well so it's not the kind of thing i would recommend you try and do implementing and getting a thorough understanding of this stuff what drives people that can give you a really really good sort of base mindset for thinking about sales in a different way and thinking about how to approach and sell to people so my advice would just be step out of your comfort zone if you if you're one of those people who only does discovery questions and is even a little bit too sort of uh, reserved to go that step one to ask the impact questions right well what impact would this have on the business or does it have or what will it have in six months um, then push yourself just that one step, one step at a time. I won't ask you to do two. If you're already asking those kind of questions, then I'm going to ask you to take that even bigger step into those personal questions. Now, the, of course, not everybody's comfortable with these, and that's why they don't ask them. That's the thing, because they, they see it as sort of, oh, this is cheesy American type of psychological stuff, but it's not. Um, this, this is, yes, psychology. This is human psychology, but this is this is the kind of stuff you need to be tapping into if you want to get a thorough understanding of how painful is this pain for this person or how important is this goal. Um, and so, so then and that's when you sort of tap into stuff like maybe you find out that somebody could use your solution and, yes, great, it can fix this and make their website really great, but the important piece is he's under pressure from his boss who's, who's maybe a, a real squeezer. Um, and if he does this and that works, then when he has his next board meeting in a month with the, the senior managers, he gets to look really great in front of those, which maybe gives him that feeling of certainty or maybe gives him that feeling of significance. Um, so it's those kind of things what you need to tap into, because then you're having a conversation. Let, let's say you've got five competitors in the pot. How many of your competitors, salespeople, do you think are going to be talking to your prospect on that level? Yeah, so instead of talking about increasing sales on your website or fixing this problem on your website, you're talking and calling and say, yeah, I'm the guy who's talking to you about uh, you know, making you look good at your next board meeting with your boss by doing this piece over here. But the detail doesn't matter. It's all about this piece here, which is what I would also refer to as the outcome when we talk about sort of features, benefits. I, I always talk about outcomes, getting to the ultimate outcome of what does this mean? Here's the feature. It helps you get this benefit. What's the end result? And that's what you need to get to if you want to really tap into sort of the, a key motive of the person you're speaking to. Should we be, maybe we, I need to reframe the question here of versus what we want to do. Should we leave it up to the customer? And should we 
be pushing them to the point where there's not stress, but there's a little bit of emotion in the, the responses that they're giving us. And that's the correct point. That's the correct level of deepness that we need to go to. Yeah, it's, it's you know, when, when I do the workshops and talk about this, I usually talk about how you uncover emotional motive. You know, that, that key motive there is, is emotional. It is. There, there's, 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 well, there's, there's not really any other motive. Uh, they're, they're emotional motives. I always refer to when I talk about motive, I tell a story and think about, think about when you go down to the beach and you, it's your first day on the beach and you, like me, are British, we understand how we are and we, we, we're never super tanned, most of us. Um, and maybe you go on the beach. For anyone the watching the video chips. now, for me, that's probably, I've, I've just spent a week in Rome and then, <laughs> then two days outside at a wedding in the hottest, like, days of summer. I'm still the whitest person. Yeah, yeah. Kind of, uh, all the, I was, myself I was and all the guests. <laughs> but I talk about that and think about the motive behind whether you make a decision or not to take your clothes off and strip down to your trunks. You know, the motive there is always balance of this pain and pleasure. And what motive are you driving towards most? Um, maybe if you've had a bad past experience, which you never know a prospect may have had, um, a bad past experience of somebody laughing at you, or maybe if there's a the, the volleyball team over there, the Spanish volleyball team with their muscles out and you're stood next to them and you're, you're thinking, should I take this top off or should I leave it on for today? Depends if it was the male or female volleyball team. That would that would dictate that one. <laughs> I don't know. There may be a big emotive, right? If it's the female one. <laughs> um, but you're always balancing sort of uh, your, from your past experiences and balancing from the pleasure. And when you and, and there's the, there's a real sort of complex balance there between what how people make a decision. So if I'm looking over there, I'm thinking, okay, ton of hot guys over there with their tans. Uh, they're going to probably be laughing at me, but I don't give a crap because I want a tan. I'm only here for a week. I may be that kind of person, but I may also be that kind of person who, oh, I remember getting bullied in school when I took off my clothes when I went to PE or whatever. Um, therefore, I'm going to keep it on. Now, you know, that, that's, of course, a, a very sort of outside of sales example of, of a, a simple decision. You know, and simple decisions are what you can sort of start thinking about. Why do you get out of bed in the morning, for example? Um, and start balancing up those kind of things and then think of that from a buyer's perspective. What what things is he balancing up? You know, a lot of the time they're balancing the pain of maybe investing this money. It's a big amount. He did this last year and it didn't work out. Therefore, there's a sort of quite a heavy balance there on the price. But if otherwise he made a decision to invest money last year and it worked out, then, of course, he may be a little more sort of uh, there be a bit more leverage on the on the pleasure side. And therefore, it will weigh a bit differently. So, so you've got to go that deep in order to really find out how serious is this? Does this guy, could he, is this a nice to have? Yes, he can fix this. Yes, this is a big problem. But if he's already making money and it's enough for him and he's making enough to go and drive his BMW, which is what he always wanted, then even if he knows damn right your solution could help, and this is what always frustrates salespeople, right? It's like, this customer needs this. I can see it. Why won't they buy it? It's probably because there's not enough sort of drive there. There's not enough motive for them to do so because they may be happy with what they've got right now. What is the end goal with all of this? So we're sat in a meeting. We ask a question. We'll use the example you just give then, David, of the person. Um, we'll use the positive version of it of they tried to do something last year and it you know, worked well. And now they're in the opportunity to either re-up on the product or uh, to, uh, to be upsold to like, the bigger version of it, whatever it is. And you ask them the question, you can see them try and try not to smile because they know you can see that they want to do it. They want to move forward with things and they're trying to play it cool. And perhaps they like uncross their arms or they, they shift the body language. And you know that you've just pulled on an emotional, um, an emotional string for them. What is the goal then from that moment? Is it to dive in and try and close a deal there and then? Is it to document that moment or the statement so that you can put that in a proposal or read it back to them that, hey, look, you said that you had great success last time and you're looking to have more success in the future so you can use their language back to them? Or is there another way of using essentially the data that we've just collected to progress the sale? Uh, of course, I mean, closing is one of those things where everybody wants to know, how do I close the deal? Um, and closing, I've actually got the smallest amount of content on. I'm always about, whenever somebody comes to me and says, I have a problem with closing, can you help me? We always end up talking about qualification because that's where the problem lies. People do not qualify in the right way. Therefore, closing becomes, it's nothing to do with their technique it's because they didn't qualify correctly. They're trying to close the wrong people. 
Um, I always say, you know, if you go, if you qualify in the right way, if you get to the impact, if you uncover an emotional impact, then you're there. So I would just say, then you need to have your sort of closing statement ready. Just like you need an opening statement ready when you open the call to pick the interest. Then you say the closing statement, say, okay, so if I can help you do this so you can get that and solve this problem or reach this goal, then uh, are you happy to go ahead? Then it shouldn't feel like an uncomfortable situation because, I mean, we, you know, we're already talking about emotional, deeper level impacts here. Therefore, this question should just seem like a natural sort of ending to that conversation. Should it almost be a relief from the deeper emotional questions that we've had of, of discovering the person's uh, emotional ties to things, why they want to do things, projecting things forward? Should it almost come a relief of, oh, and here's the solution. You don't need to think about that stuff anymore. You can do it. Not really. No, it's um, it's not that simple, right? It it can be the the situations can be very simple sometimes, but sometimes they can be very complex. Um, so and again, it's it's about that balance of who you're dealing with and where, where are we on that scale? You know, if if they're they're all the way up here and you have got a lot of pleasure, then of course the pain levels down here they they think the solution the price wise is okay. They can see all of this value. Then of course it's a no brainer. Therefore we should easily be able to get closure on it. Whereas if we're here, then, of course, we, we, we need to then be, try it a little more carefully. And it's going to depend on that person, their position. Uh, you know, a lot of salespeople still try to close too hard on the wrong people because they don't qualify who should be involved by the time they get there. Um, and, and not all solutions can be closed in that one conversation on that one day. Uh, there's a process. It depends on what you're selling. If you're selling short term sales cycles, low value products, all day long, yes, you need to be sort of trying to close as quickly as possible, maybe on one call. If, if, I'd go even if you've got two-week sales cycles. If you've got the right prospect, you can close on one call. But I think once you go over that, three, four, three months or whatever, six weeks, then, then of course, we're at a stage there where being the pushy salesperson, it's gone. It doesn't work. It puts people off. So you can ruin everything what you've done. I, believe, I really do believe that if you go to those emotional needs and – really, really qualify and listen intently. And that, that's what builds rapport with somebody. Then they trust you and they really know themselves. You know, you've sort of helped them get clarity around why they would buy this solution. Then if you've done it in the right way, same with the coaching session, it's not me who comes up with the answers, it's you. I just ask you the questions so that you can come up with the right answers and the right solutions for yourself. Therefore, it's sort of not upon me to sort of push it on you because I've not pushed it. It was your idea, Will. So, so what do you think? Would you, would you like to, it's a really good idea you came up with there. I, I ready to go ahead with it. You, what are the next steps? So, so it's of course reverse psychology in a way, in many ways. Um, and it's, it's all about creating that right environment by asking the right questions in the right way and sort of turning that conversation on its head. Um, people always talk about talking and listening and speaking, you know, 80, 20, 70, 30. I'm just like, you know, in a conversation with a sale, with a, a prospect, I used to speak maybe 10% of the time. If you ask the right questions, you'll get all the information and then you sort of put their own words back into their own mouths afterwards. And then they sort of can see for themselves, oh, I came up with this idea. This is actually a pretty good idea. Let's go for it. Makes total sense. I'm glad for that. I'm glad you, because most of the audience are uh, higher end capital B2B sales, kind of my background in medical devices of anything from... 50k to kind of a couple of million for the different hospitals locally that we did deals with um so i'm i'm i i was perhaps i worded it wrong in what i was perhaps saying was how do you end a conversation and do you pull on this and should it be a relief at the end of the conversation but you answered that and framed it nicely of the close should just come naturally i appreciate that and with that david because i'm conscious of time here mate got one final question that i ask everyone that comes on the show and that is if you could go back in time and speak to your younger self what would be the one piece of advice you'd give him to help him become better at selling? To become better at selling, stop being so damn stubborn and think you know it all. <laughs> I was, I was, I always, I think this served me well when I moved into sort of training and even more so with coaching. But uh, when I went into training, I always used to plan my sessions and build my sessions around how do I break down resistance in the first five or 10 minutes? Because I knew what kind of salesperson I always was. I was a good salesperson, always on target, not always, of course, but eventually. And when I got to that level, then I sort of, I always remember being sort of a bit know-it-all. You know, you can't teach me everything. I know everything. And then, of course, uh, now when I learn so much, 
And, and I have always self-taught myself and read books and took inspiration. But I just believe, I just really wish that, I, you know, when I discovered Tony Robbins, that was the second time I'd came across him. And I remember how closed I was the first time because I just saw him as some cheesy American guy who was just <laughs> selling snake oil, as people yeah. usually say, right? And now I've been through all of his stuff. And, of course, I've trained myself in NLP. I'm a practitioner in NLP. And I've sort of learned so much. And it always makes me think back and think, my God, if I'd have learned this stuff and took on this stuff when I was 18, 19, even 25, whatever, where would I be now? How much more would I have progressed? How much better would I have been? Um, so, so I would definitely say, you know, just just be completely open. Even if you turn on, I turned on Gary Vee for the first time. You what? You you follow Gary Vee? Uh-huh. I turned him on for the first time, like uh, I don't know, six weeks ago. I tried to listen to him for the first like five minutes. I was like, oh my god, this guy gives me a headache. Turned it off. But then I purposely sort of remind myself of those past experiences. It's like, let's go back to him. And I went back to him. It's like, you know what? Okay, he's he's he he has his style. Yes, it can seem quite aggressive, but this guy knows his stuff. I can learn a lot of stuff and just keep following his his blocks and stuff. So so keep an open mind. Don't be stubborn. You don't know everything. Um, the the more you learn, the younger you learn, then just think about where you'll be when you're 30 or 40 or 50 or whatever. Uh, rather than do what I do, which is learn it now, get great value from it, but keep thinking, God, I wish I'd have learned this 10 years earlier. I think there's an interesting phenomenon here and we don't have time to cover it. We could probably coach us on it in another episode of being in the right place to accept whatever knowledge versus making yourself open to it. Because I know I got a lot of value out of reading. Well, it's it's what led me to understand um, what drove me in understanding that I'm probably never going to be suitable to one sit in an office. 100% I will never be able to sit in an office for more than six months without annoying myself and annoying everyone around me. And then two, even in field sales, I needed some kind of ownership of what I was doing to feel fulfilled. And I got all that from Tony Robbins' book. But it took me twice reading it to decipher what was going on in my own brain. And then what I was thinking as you were telling us that, David, was that I've tried to push that book on every or that um, Awaken the Giant Within. I've tried to give it to my girlfriend. She's not interested. I've tried to give it to my little brother who reads all the time not interested he read some self-help stuff as well but just not interested my youngest brother who could probably get the most value out of it and it would i think it would help him not grow up because he is he is a, like a young man but it would help him know himself a little bit better and i think he could make bigger and better decisions by i've gone through that process but he won't even touch a book who reads books <laughs> is the feedback i get from him of maybe he would listen to listen to it on an audio book but then it's so vast the book it'd probably take 15 hours to get through so that wouldn't happen either so i i just I, it was just an interesting phenomenon there of do you need can you force yourself to be open to this kind of stuff or do you have to just be in the right place in your life at the right moment have had the right things happen to spark an interest or spark a, a series of neurons to be accepting to to these kind of things and, and clearly that's a four-hour conversation in itself so with that david tell us where we can find out more about you uh everything that you're doing on the sales and leadership coaching side of things and uh, anything else that you're up to you can find out about me on my uh, website it's maybe not super updated because i'm busy with other stuff www.davidcraigwhite.com um alternatively you can probably find me on linkedin just say we've done business together if you watch the uh, podcast i'm always happy to connect um and yeah of course uh, services wise I, I do a lot of one-to-one coaching these days whether that's with the leadership people or whether that's also with salespeople. um i tend to do yeah workshops yes i can do remote workshops and things but i i, I prefer to spend most of my time doing coaching rather than workshops um because i believe of course there's a lot more prolonged value out of workshops so uh, so yeah uh, i travel around the world i'm based here in, in denmark i have a look, some customers here but i also have clients in in the uk still as well and uh, also in other other countries so but uh, yeah those are the main places you can find me and um, keep your eye out for my uh, upcoming book as well it's almost ready but then again i've been saying that for about three years <laughs> stop talking start selling um, I'm hoping that's going to be ready within the uh, the next uh, three months. I'm going to say it's in copy editing now, final copies. So uh, so fingers crossed that will be uh, on the markets uh, very soon. Amazing stuff. Well, I will link to all of that in the show notes when the book comes out. I'll link that back in the show notes for anyone who catches this further down in time. Congratulations on the book. That's a, a big step to get to the copy editing process. So congrats on that. And with that, David, I want to thank you for joining us on the Salesman Podcast. Thank you very much, Will. It's my pleasure.